Uh, good morning, Pastor. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome good morning. Uh, to the class. Good morning. Aaron, Thomas, Kiran, Siddharth, and others were coming in. Welcome. Okay. Good morning. Let's uh, take a moment to pray, and then we'll get started. I have uh, started the recording for this class, so this class lecture will be recorded for the benefit of other people. Could somebody just pray, and we will proceed into the class. Could somebody lead us in prayer? Thomas, would you like to pray for us, please? Sure, Pastor. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your mercy and grace, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us so much. Mm -hmm. Father, we bless this day. We bless this heart in Jesus' name. As we sit down here, the word, Father, anoint us, anoint Pastor Ashish, in Jesus' name, O Lord. Help us to understand each and everything. Father, let the beneficial benefit our life and to the kingdom of God and the body of Christ. We thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining this class on church and ministry administration. I hope you are finding these things um, useful. Um, some of you, uh, these may be some things that, uh, you know, maybe you're already using, some of you can already use. Uh, for some, it may be uh, in the future, you know, as things, uh, as uh, maybe you start your own church, or your own ministry, and in the future, as you're growing, uh, you may need to do these things. So, you know, um, even if you're not able to use it immediately, some of the, you know, these practical things in ministry uh, will be useful. What I want to do today is just quickly review uh, what we covered uh, in the class on Wednesday on uh, uh, policies, guidelines, and standards. Just quickly review it. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you're most welcome to ask. And I also want to uh, touch on some of the things I feel I need to emphasize, which I did not touch on uh, in the class on Wednesday. Uh, so I want to just address some of those to kind of keep, bring this to a close, this, this whole area on policies, guidelines, and standards. And uh, I just want us to understand uh, that this is the importance of uh, having these policies, guidelines, and standards in the organization, as a church, uh, as a ministry. Now, keep in mind that... Uh, when you're starting a ministry or when you're starting an organization or when the organization is still small, uh, you may not have too many areas to worry about, you know, because maybe you're, you know, the ministry itself, you're engaged in a few areas. But uh, what I would encourage all of us, even when our ministries are small or the organizations in which we are working are small, uh, from uh, an early stage in your journey, uh, try to use this uh, important uh, thing about policies, guidelines, and uh, standards. Uh, one of the earliest things we did, uh, apart from you know uh, the staff guidelines, which is when you are when a person is joining an organization, you set up staff guidelines. One of the earliest things that we started was uh, volunteer guidelines, volunteer team guidelines. And this, I think, will be relevant for any Christian ministry or organization. Because uh, in any, you know, whether it's a church or whether it's a Christian organization, you are going to have volunteers. And uh, even when you are just starting out, even when you are just small uh, as a ministry or as a church, um, it is good to put down uh, in a document guidelines for those who are going to serve as volunteers. Now, you know, the tendency in church and the tendency in, um, in uh, 
many Christian organizations is, okay, you're, you're a volunteer, come on and join, you know, especially I'm talking about in the early stage. Oh yeah, just come and help, you know, just come and do this or come and do that. Now it's good, it's it's nice to be warm and wel welcoming and open for volunteers to come in and making making it easy for them to come in and volunteer. But from an organization perspective, it is important to at least have some guidelines written down in a, in a document and you have a conversation, whoever it is, you know, uh, uh, enlisting the volunteers to work, uh, to do their work in, in various teams, to have a conversation, say, hey, uh, this, these are the guidelines. Uh, this is what we expect from those who are going to be volunteering uh, in the church or in the organization, Christian organization. Just have, you know, you're not making it like a, uh, you're not making a big deal, a big, big deal, but it's important to communicate that because if something goes wrong, now volunteers, you have to handle them differently from church staff or consultants because staff and consultants have some sense of accountability because they are uh, they are salaried volunteers uh, they are offering their time or they're offering their skill to the church or to the organization so you have to be handle them carefully so it's better to have these things put down and just because we can see as a volunteer this is what we expect right now while you know, while we were doing that, you know, having these guidelines for volunteers, uh, and now you can have a you have a copy of that from our uh, the, the 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 web page that I shared with you uh, last class. Now, while we were doing that, we also understood that uh, we need so the guidelines not only addressed the conduct aspect that means how you conduct yourself as a volunteer but it also took care of the practical side. Okay, so in this role, these are the things you're supposed to do. Okay, if you're a volunteer at the book table, okay, this is what we expect. You know, you need to be, uh, the book table has to be set up half an hour before service starts. You know, so those kind of details have to be in the guidelines uh, for the volunteer. So eventually what you'll have is, not only will you have a statement of conduct, that means this is what we expect volunteers, how, to, how they conduct themselves, but you'll have guidelines for specific areas of ministry um, that have to be written down. So that will come eventually. So if you're a volunteer in the worship team, what is, you know, what is the, uh, what are the expectations over there? You know, so that will be written down. If you're a volunteer in, you know, a volunteer who's helping with ushering in a service, what is expected? If a volunteer is ushering in, you know, being a, you know, part of the welcome team, well, what is expected there? So eventually what will happen is uh, you will have guidelines written for different roles, right? Different roles, you will have guidelines. And another thing that we learned was also that the more visible the role is, the higher the standard of conduct should be. Now, in general, of course, all of us have to, you know, uh, maintain godly conduct, especially in a church or a Christian organization, it's standard. But what I'm saying is the more visible, you have to be more careful. Because what I experienced was, you know, we had volunteers serving in so many different roles, but when there were volunteers who were part of the worship team, they were the ones who were, you know, the congregation observes. The congregation knows, hey, these people are up on stage and they are volunteer. I mean, of course, they're all, many of them are volunteers. They are serving in the worship team, but uh, I would get emails like, you know, uh, today, uh, it, all kinds of things, you know, the, the clothes, <laughs> the, the attire that the person on the worship team was wearing was not, uh, you know, not suitable. So I'll get an email, please you know, tell them to wear <laughs> these kind of clothes. Or uh, if the worship team, you know, after they finished leading worship, they went and sat down. And then if they didn't, you know, if they got up and they walked out uh, after service, I'll get an 
email or some complaint from somebody that, hey, why did the worship team member go out of the service uh, during the worship, during the service? This is not a good example. You know, because uh, the more visible the role is, people are watching and, uh, you know, they're, they're expecting a certain standard uh, from the volunteers. And so, you know, we had to reinforce this over and over again, uh, put it down in writing. And sometimes you have to be very explicit, you know, and we were saying, okay, worship team members, you need to be seated on the front row. Uh, you know, uh, you know, example was uh, when we're transitioning at the end of the sermon into worship. Uh, and I would say worship team come, they need to be up on stage within a minute and be ready to, you know, start singing. So, if there was a delay, you know, the congregation is wondering what's happening, all those things. So we had to detail that, you know, worship team members sit down in front of the row. As soon as pastor says, come, you need to be on the stage and in those kind of things. So these are guidelines that I'm just giving some practical things. And we went through all of these and for different areas of ministries and people would give us feedback and we need to put down these. These are guidelines for people who are serving in different areas of ministry, and especially when they are volunteers, you have to handle them, uh, you know, uh, in a little bit more gentle way. And yet at the same time, you you know, they have to uh, meet certain, ex you know, standards have to be maintained. So uh, these are things you have to think about. And what I would recommend is start doing this uh, early in your ministry. Right. Even when your ministry is small, put down the whatever you can, whatever you observe, put it down. How do you want your volunteers to conduct themselves? Put it down, and uh, and you know go over it with them repeatedly. And I remember in those early days, we had to bring the teams together very often and go over the guidelines again and again because you know. Uh, eventually everything comes back to the pastors. You know, the congregation is holding the pastors accountable uh, for the conduct of everybody who is serving. And it comes back to us. And we have to answer to the congregation when, you know, something happens. So, um, yeah, so let me just uh, go over that document one more time. I just want to impress uh, on us the, uh, the importance, you know, of these... Uh, policies, guidelines, and standards, and just share some practical uh, situation scenarios. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we emphasize the importance of it and I'm emphasizing, you know, have it written down uh, so that everybody knows very clearly uh, what is expected. And uh, we talked about the administrative policies. This is how the organization will function internally, uh, this is what I was talking about, right? The volunteer team guidelines, so team specific guidelines. So at some point, what will happen is uh, uh, you have uh, guidelines for your volunteer team members, okay? But then you also will have to have guidelines that are team specific for the different areas where people are involved, you have guidelines. now. Guidelines are not like the Ten Commandments, right? These are just, you know, these are like, so let's all, it's, it's more of an invitation to the team saying, hey, let's all adhere to these standards so that uh, we can all, you know, uh, uh, function together well, hold ourselves to a certain standard of conduct or, you know, those kinds of things. So uh, we're not putting them down as, you know, like, you know, in a harsh way, but it's more like inviting people to uh, adhere to those standards. And then what will happen, another area that you would need guidelines is an interaction between teams. So example, we have the book table team. Now they are responsible for setting up the books, uh, you know, making the books available to the people. Now we also have a publications team that does the publications. I mean, they get it done. They get the books printed, etc. Now they will have to interact because uh, uh, you know the, when the when the book table is running out of stock, they need to inform 
uh, publications so that books can be delivered to the various locations where they are on display. So just a, one example of interaction. So like that, you know, your various teams will have to interact with each other. So uh, especially, for example, in a worship setting, there is a worship team. They prepare a set of songs that they need to sing. They're going to sing. But the media presentation team needs to know what are the songs so that they can project the lyrics. And uh, then if you're doing live streaming, the live streaming team also would need to know what is being presented so that they can show those lyrics and uh, or, you know, while for the live stream audience. So the media presentation team is taking care of what is being projected inside the auditorium. There's another team that's taking care of what's happening to those who are on the live stream and there's a worship team. So now they all have to be in sync. They all have to interact. So now who's responsible for what, you know? So then that has to be detailed. So you put the responsibility in the worship team, worship team, you're selecting the songs. So you have to send the lyrics and you're to send that, make sure that the spellings, the lyrics are correct. Uh, you know, all of that, that's the responsibility of the worship team. Uh, so till that point, it's the worship team's responsibility. And then who is going to send it over to the media team? The media team's responsibility is to make sure it comes up on the screen, you know, at the right time, all of that and in the right way. And then the live streaming team, they also need to put, put the lyrics so that on, on the lower third of the video, uh, so that people who are watching online can see it. So that interaction between teams need to happen and that has to be detailed. So as your church or your ministry is growing, slowly, you know, these details, these guidelines for volunteers for the various teams, for the team interactions. These things have to be detailed and communicated to people. Otherwise, you know, if you don't have that, then it, it, it could be a lot of chaos every time, you know, something needs to be done because they will say, oh, I thought that, pe that team will do it. This team will say, no, I thought team C will do it. There will be confusion, right? So uh, have it written down for even the volunteers and the teams. And uh, uh, like we mentioned, you know, once you have it written down, it's very easy to bring on new people. So if new volunteers want to join or new staff want to join, you just have to tell them, hey, look, just go through immediately, go through uh, what, what has been done, right? That this is, these are what's required of you. Just follow these things. And it's very easy to bring on new people to uh, join as uh, staff or volunteers. And another important thing of, you know, writing these standards down is that you, the improvements that are made don't have to be reinvented. You know, for example, take graphics work, you know, uh, and, 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 and we went through this whole process because in the early days, okay, we, we made mistakes. Uh, but then, you know, if you don't document, if you don't capture the learnings from those mistakes, uh, you, you cannot maintain that level of improvement. So let's say a new person joins your graphics team. You don't want to start back on level zero and make repeat all those mistakes. You want to start if you're on level four, you've made all the, you've, you've, you know, you made all the mistakes and you're at, at a certain standard of uh, uh, where you are. You want, when a new person joins, you want to start off at level four and keep moving up. You don't want to go back to level zero and repeat mistakes. So when you capture your learnings and establish them as standards in a document, what happens? Uh, you're, you're passing on the learning to new people and uh, you don't have to repeat mistakes. So the quality and the consistency is ensured regardless of who does the work. So that is a very important thing you know, when you write down, okay, so example, our graphics, you know, what are the standards for them? And you can pick up the documents, you know, um, available on our guidelines webpage, you know, you can see, uh, well, it has to be, these are the dimensions that we're going to use for on the website, for, you know, promotions on social media, for promotions on, 
you know, on uh, Sunday announcements. These are the standard size of all the graphics. These are the standard, uh, you know, established standards in terms of colors, features, whatever. You know, you're establishing those standards. So people don't have to repeat mistakes. They just come, they read it through, they understand what the standards are, and they, they begin to do those things, right? So these are practice standards and uh, they are important. Okay. One thing that I did not uh, mention here, and it's not, uh, uh, I should include it, which I wanted to mention today, is similarly, you need to have accounting policies. Accounting policy means how um, finances are going to be uh, managed. So, um, uh, obviously, uh, much of this is determined by the accountant or the accounting people who are handling the money uh, for the organization. But the organization should have accounting policies. So that also has to be documented. So for example, what are the things a staff or a volunteer uh, or a staff or a consultant or a volunteer will get reimbursed for. That means if they spend some of their money on doing something, can they expense it and get reimbursed for that? You know, so that has to be documented. Okay, this is the policy. Suppose you are on work and uh, you, okay, example, you know, when, when our, our uh, video team uh, goes offsite, goes somewhere to do a video shoot so they take, you know, there's a team of three, four people, or, you know, and sometimes we have uh, uh, vendors also coming in who bring their cameras and all of that. And uh, so it's a full day's work somewhere offsite. Uh, then they order lunch and they order, you know, they may order breakfast, lunch and or snack or tea, coffee, whatever. So as part of the accounting policy, you state when you're on an assignment like this offsite, and uh, you're, you're, you know somebody's ordering food, the food will be covered. The cost for the food will be covered, but this is how much you can spend, right? So it's, it's clear. So people know. So the, the people in the uh, video team, video shoot team know that uh, when they are offsite and they have to go do some shoot somewhere, you know, uh, their breakfast and lunch and, you know, the order tea or coffee for them and for the vendors who come with their equipment, it's covered. And, but this is the range in which you should order food. Right? So that's an accounting policy. So the other thing, you know, we established in the beginning is all reimbursements uh, must have bills. So there has to be a bill against which the money is paid back to the staff or the volunteer, you know, so without a bill, you know, money cannot be reimbursed. So it's a normal thing. So somebody cannot just go to the account and say, and, and say, uh, you know, I spent so much money. No, there has to be a bill. There has to be uh, uh, a proof. And then we also have an approval process. That means before you spend the money, I mean, I, I'm not talking about the food thing, but you know, for something else, something that's bigger, uh, you know, it has to be approved and then you spend it and then you'll get expensed for it. So you have an approval process. That's again, part of your accounting, right? So uh, in, all, in all of that I shared last week, I, I would add accounting policies. That means uh, things that have to do with money. It has to be written down for your staff and also for your volunteers. Right? So they're very clear that uh, these are the things that if you spend money for the work that you need to do for church or for the ministry, uh, you will get reimbursed for it. And, and these are things we do not do. Right? So that depends on your organization and so on. Right? And different organizations may do different things. For instance, uh, uh, we, uh, we do not provide phones, mobile phones for our staff. So we say, use, please use your own phone. Right. Uh, otherwise, we'll have to buy phones for so many people. So we just tell them, you know, so it's a standard. That's our policy. Uh, we don't provide phones. 
but uh, there are selected numbers like for member care for uh, certain, like I think we have three numbers, three or four numbers. Those are paid for by the, uh, by the church because they're designated numbers for church work. The others, they're using their own personal forms. Um, so uh, we don't pay people for their, for their uh, fuel, but we say that if they are on, an, uh, on a work-related assignment that where they have to, they're consuming a lot of fuel, then for that, they get paid. You know? so, so those things have to be clarified. So then they have to expense that. They have to show, you know, this is what I did for work-related. Not for coming to office and going home, that, that they don't get uh, reimbursed, but for something work-related, that will be expensed. So certain things like that, you know, have to be clarified so people know. This is what I get expensed for. This is what I don't get uh, reimbursed for um, as far as the accounting policy, the financial policies within the organization. And this has to be written down. Now, for very mature organizations, uh, it is what to say. It is a given thing. You know, they always have it in place. They've been doing it for years. But mm, I'm, I'm speaking. You know, um, many of you will be going out and starting your ministries, starting your churches, um, or you may be working in organizations that are starting out. So, when you're new, uh, it is good to. Uh, you know, put all these things in place and make use of it. Okay. The last thing uh, is, uh, you know, uh, when 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 you have uh, email communications happening, and you know, and if if you're going to do software development and all, uh, uh, you know, it's good to follow standards there as well. Um, I, I won't talk much about it. Uh, you know, usually the IT people will understand that. But I just want to say in terms of emails, you know, very important, again, when you are, when people are communicating on behalf of the organization. So let's say you have somebody, you know, <clears throat> who's handling emails uh, that are come, come to your organization and, you know, they're, 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 they're responding to emails on, on behalf of the organization. It's important to have standards there also, you know, some simple things like it has to be, you know, there should be no spelling mistakes. Sorry, uh, the English language and grammar should be good. Uh, this is what you, you know, you follow. So for example, for us, we say we will follow American standard in our English. So the English should be American standard, the dates should be international standard. So uh, we don't write dates in Indian format. We don't write dates in US format. We write it in a global format. So that means, uh, we always spell out like M A Y two zero twenty twenty one. So it, it's put out that way. So regardless whether the person is from America or the, any other part of the world, they understand what the date is. Uh, because if you write the date in Indian standard, other people may not understand it. If you write the date in U.S. standard, others may not understand it. it. Can cause confusion. So you have to be, you know, you say okay, all documentation, all emails. All communications should follow in you know, a generic format so that anybody in the world who emails us, when we respond to them, they understand, you know, clear, there's no miscommunication. And then you have standard templates for certain things. For example, uh, we have a template or example, exam. There is a standard template we use when we have to send an announcement about somebody's passing away. Right? So let's say a, a congregation member has passed away uh, and we need to notify people in our congregation that you know, so-and-so has passed away and, uh, and uh, this is when the funeral is happening, etc. So we have a standard template uh, that you know, it, it should have this amount of information. You have to get permission from the bereaved family get them to provide the details, and then you send the email. So it's a standard process and a standard format. Now, why is a standard format important in a situation like that? Because you don't want to miss out on some information. You know, some, if you tell them to, you know, just, you know, just send an email, sometimes they will mention the name, full name. Sometimes they may forget to mention, you know, the date of 
demise, or they may forget to mention the cause of demise or the age of the person, uh, you know, various things. So we have a standard template that makes sure that every email, any email that is sent with this announcement will have all these details, including a picture of the person who passed away. It's a format. So that's another thing you can practice. That is, you create certain templates for things that are recurring, you know, email templates, uh, to make sure that every email has all the required information and has been worded correctly and, uh, and is sent out, you know, to the people. So uh, that's another thing I would share here is um, for emails, make sure that, you know, your, your, your team or the person who's handling the communications uh, creates these templates. You can, all you have to do is check it once and you know that every time they send an email for a certain thing, uh, it's all covered. Okay. So, so I just wanted to, uh, you know, cover those things because I missed mentioning that on Wednesday. And lastly, uh, I just want to spend a minute on this and a few minutes on this and then we'll take questions. You know, one of the things, and uh, unfortunately, one of the things uh, that you should be ready to handle is that uh, sometimes, and I'm not saying everybody, some, sometimes some believers, they view you know, this whole thing of policies, guidelines, and standards as being very controlling and legalistic. So they have a negative view when uh, you as a leader or a pastor um, say, look, uh, let's have some policies. These are the things you're going to follow. Uh, these are the guidelines or these are the standards. Uh, some, you know, believers will look at it as legalism. Why are you creating some new rules or laws or whatever, you know? Why can't uh, everything be uh, free? Uh, just people do what as they feel like. And, uh, why are you doing these things, right? So that's something you should be prepared for in some situations. Now, some believers, believers will understand your motivation. They'll know why you're doing it. But sometimes they may question and call it legalism. So how would we, you know, respond to that? How would we handle something like that? I just want to get your thoughts. So suppose, you know, you are, you know, introducing some guidelines or some policies or some standards in, you know, a certain area of your church or your ministry. And somebody says, why are you doing that? Why do we need it? How would you, you know, in a loving way explain or how would you handle it? I just want your thoughts. Daryl, what do you think? Pastor, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes. All right. So, uh, you know, just to put it in a loving way, I think uh, we need to explain them saying, uh, you know, since, uh, you know, we are organized, the church is organized, so we do everything, uh, you know, as per order. So, you know, so that's the reason we are, you know, having certain guidelines to follow it and also keep it in a standard manner. It's, you know, it's, it doesn't mean, you know, church, we can have it in a, in, have, have the services or anything in, a, in any way, but we need to have it in a order. So uh, you know, that's the reason we are putting certain guidelines. So I uh, just, you know, as you said, Pastor, so we need to put it in a, in a loving way. So graciously, we need to put it so mm -hmm. people will uh, accept graciously. So. Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. So just explain to them why we are doing this, help them understand it. Any other thoughts on, you know, if, if you get this kind of a pushback from people saying, why are you putting in some standards? Why are you putting these guidelines? 
why are you you know how how would how would you handle it in your church or in your christian organization any other thoughts Thomas, have you um, experienced anything like this in your, uh, in your, uh, so far in your experience? Oh, too busted. The thing is, when we uh, discipline, nobody will likes. <laughs> That's I'm really facing that difficulty when uh, it's a beginning stage. If, if you want me speak to speak, when I'm say uh, the certain things. They're not, not ready to follow the youngsters. I think need a time to uh, grow in the word of God. Then only we can able to do that. I don't know how to do the things. I'm still learning. Mm. It's very quiet part. When we say certain things, um, people are uh, not ready to accept us. That's the difficulty. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes they may even think that... Um... You know, we're not giving them enough freedom. They may think we are being outdated when we you know, expect certain standards. Uh, I feel like too crunching and uh, monitoring what is this and all this church don't no, like that and all they feel. Mm, yeah. 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 That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So we did have, uh, you know, I mean, uh, some of the things that we went through uh is a little funny um one funny thing i can think of was uh, in the early days uh you know we you know we as a church um, and this is going way back in time um um uh, uh, in the early years, uh, you know, we, 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 we wanted to be open to all kinds of people. And so we had uh, and uh, urban youth. But we had also a lot of youth who were coming to church who had just moved to the city. Okay, so you would, we would call them, uh, uh, they had grown up in, you know, uh, smaller towns, and they had moved to the city. And so uh, you had youth who... Uh, you know, always grew up in an urban culture. And then you had youth who had just moved into uh, the city. So they were still transitioning. And I remember in those days, uh, uh, you know, you could actually see, you know, two kinds of youth in the church. Uh, and the youth in the urban, you know, they were very free with each other, very relaxed and, you know, they would mingle and uh, do all these things. But uh, the youth here would look at very strangely at uh, the behavior and the mannerisms of uh, uh, the the youth who, the urban youth, you know. So there was that difficulty in them being assimilated in the same congregation. So we are one congregation, same congregation, but because of the background, you know, uh, there was that, uh, I would say, a disconnect between among the young people itself. And and so, you know, uh, so what, 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 you know, and I remember those days, we, we had to address urban youth, you know, we had to talk to them and say, hey, you know, uh, here are some changes you can make in order to welcome these kinds of people who are, who are moving into the city. They're coming in mainly for college or for study, uh, for work. And they're coming to they're in the same church. But culturally, you know, you need to be sensitive. You need to, you know, avoid doing certain things so that they will feel comfortable. Those kind of, you know, we have to have those conversations. And it's, it's a funny thing that you're having a, a, a conversation on, on, on those things. But uh, we had to talk about it. And then we had to set some guidelines for our worship team, who had a lot of youth in it, uh, so that we could be more, you know, accommodating, welcoming to young people, regardless of their, you know, their uh, their backgrounds and so on. So we had those kinds of conversations, and uh, it was not easy because 
you know, why you, you know, hey, we have, we'll do what we want kind of thing. But then you put in some guidelines, especially for those who are youth leaders and those among the youth who are actually being in influencing, influential positions, leadership positions. You know, for them, we had to set some guidelines so that the goal was to make everybody feel welcome in church, you know. So we went through that. And there was pushback, but we had to stand firm on our, our ultimate goal was we want everybody to feel welcome in the church, regardless of their background. You know? And so we had to stand firm in certain guidelines and things like that. So um, if we, you know, we explain it, we have to work with them and uh, help put these guidelines in place, standards, policies, and so on. Any questions? Pastor, Any, uh, yeah. Yeah, Pastor. So one more thing, you know, regarding this the guidelines. So, uh, you know, the church where we uh, currently go in Coimbatore. So, uh, you know, every week, every month, a uh, couple of uh, weeks, they have a uh, youth meeting. So it's not properly, uh, you know, uh, in an order or organized manner. So, uh, you know, a couple of weeks we had a meeting. So Pastor was saying, how do we do it? and uh, you know uh, how we can take it ahead how we can keep it organized so to be honest so, uh, you know i uh, took our church as an example you know we has you know uh, we as apc how we do it how the staff you know how the guidelines the church guidelines for the worship team for the youth uh, everything helps and every you know how it uh, you know enhance uh, you know the youth and you know other people in the church you know following the certain guidelines for every team so I explained, you know, each and everything, you know, for the youth. So they accepted graciously. Like right? they said, you know, uh, I told them like in terms of, uh, you know, time and, uh, you know, attending the youth meeting and, uh, you know, uh, being being diligent about it. So everything I explained step by step and uh, they accepted graciously, Pastor. So I thought I'll mm. share this. So now, you know, they are planning to have a you know, certain guideline, how to keep it and how to make it good. And mm -hmm. I really, you know, felt good about it, you know, sharing, uh, you know, uh, us as an example and giving them, you know, certain guidelines. So, you know, so going on, everything is going to be fine, I believe. So uh, they, are, uh, they are also happy. They accepted graciously, you know, mm -hmm. whatever I suggested. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So I think people, um, you know, will be receptive and they see the good that comes out of the policies, guidelines, standards we play, put in place. Uh, people will be accepting. Okay. So uh, that's, I think hopefully that's a, in, enough discussion on this uh, area of organization. Uh, although it's a very important area, uh, I hope, uh, you know, I've uh, impressed uh, on, on your heart that this is important to put in place and feel free to use the resources, you know, that we have. And of course, these guidelines will be updated. Keep updating it as we keep learning, as we discover various scenarios. Uh, we'll update our guidelines, but you're welcome to, you know, modify it, use it to for your church, for your organization. So next week, we will move on to uh, the next aspect of uh, uh, church and ministry administration, which is systems and processes. So that means, uh, again, it's getting more into, you know, how you run, how to run the church and the ministry as a good organization. And uh, you know, to run it as a good organization, it's important to put systems in place and processes in place uh, so that, you know, the organization functions like a good uh, you know, I, mean, I want to use the word machine, but uh, it functions well, and um, and uh, and we'll get into that next week and explain certain things of that. Okay, so let's wrap up in prayer. Thank you for being part of the class today, and uh, yeah, somebody could close in prayer. Who wants to pray? Conan, is your phone okay? Oh. All right, your phone is a problem. You got a problem with your phone. All right, now mine. Then uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Kiran. Oh, Conan, we can't hear you. Okay, Kiran, why don't you pray and dismiss us, please? 
Yes, sir. Father God, we come before one second, your throne, Father God, Father God, thanking you for everything, Father God, thanking you for subject, Father God, we learn, Father God, we are learning, Father God, one new thing in our life, Father God, so thank you, Father God, Father God, help us to uh, walk systematically, love and humbleness, Father God, and help us to orderly and maintain the discipline and perfect thing as you are perfect, Father God, help us to walk like that, Father God, teach every your way, Father God, to your kingdom work we will like you we will use father god help us to every side father god and give you more knowledge and wisdom that we can understand and we can use to your kingdom way thanking you father for our class thanking you sir and thanking you father god all the student father god thanking you almighty jesus name we pray amen amen all right thank you everyone uh see you again next week enjoy the weekend god bless you thank you Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you.